morning, everybody. Uh, this is the intro to episode A of the Terrible Railway Collision. I, like a lot of people with an interest in railways, was given train books when I was a kid, including this one, Steel Roads of New Zealand. It contains a section on the first period of New Zealand's railway history called Railways on a Shoestring. One of the chapters in it is Smoke Signals in Rakaia, and it recounts the collision that I'm going to be dealing with, or at least I'm going to be introducing in this episode. One of the difficulties with telling the story is that I live a long way from Rakaia. Another difficulty is that there's almost nothing left of the railway as it existed in 1899. I took a couple of photos the last time I was down there, and as you can see, there is a main road only. So, in telling this story, uh, I've had to use, I've had to extemporise the Waverley Railway Station to play the role of Rakaia and the former Tahorta Station on the Waitara Heritage Line playing the role of the station at Chertsey. Anyway, let's get into it. Cue period music. All the girls and they love her so Always jolly Heart that is true, I know She is the sunshine of paradise early The evening of Saturday the 11th of March 1899 was going to be busier than usual for Rakaia's station master John May. On an ordinary Saturday, he and his staff would be dealing with the down train to Ashburton that would arrive at this platform here at about 6.52pm. There'd be passengers looking to start their journey, passengers ending their journey, and other passengers transferring to the Metton branch platform over to my left. That down train to Ashburton would then move off and complete its last 17 miles, and then a bit later in the evening, an up train, an express from Dunedin through to Littleton, would pull up. Again, there would be an exchange of passengers. And then the Metvin train would be free to leave, and the express would make its way to Littleton. And Rakaia would have its quiet Saturday night. It was John May's responsibility to ensure the safety of every train and every person in his railway yard. And his responsibility, by definition, started here at the facing points and ended at the other end of the yard with the other set of facing points. John May's responsibility that Saturday evening was made more onerous due to two picnic trains that would be arriving on his main line, travelling from Ashburton to Christchurch. And those trains would be separated by a 10-minute safety interval and they would both cross the down train to Ashburton at his station. The sequence was supposed to be that the leading picnic train would arrive at 6.47. It would park here on the main line at the platform. Five minutes later, the southbound train to Ashburton would pull up, and it would park on the first siding. That would mean that the line to Christchurch is now vacant and the first picnic train can move off. Five minutes later, supposedly, the second picnic train would pull up here and that would mean that the train to Ashburton now had a vacant line and it could move off. The second picnic train would need to wait out its 10-minute safety period before John May authorised its guard to get the train moving to Christchurch. That at least was the plan. The picnic trains were specials. What that means is that they don't appear in the working timetable for this particular section of line. Instead their existence was formalised by the issuing of a working notice. That working notice is distributed to the train's crew but also to the various stations on the route including this one here at Chertsey. That working notice is silent with respect to Chertsey. The fact that Chertsey doesn't appear on the notice does not mean the train could steam through with impunity. 
it still had to follow the protocol. And that protocol was that on approaching the station, the train would whistle for a signal. Once the staff at Chertsey heard that whistling for a signal, they were obliged to give one in response. A red would mean stop at the station limits and don't enter until signaled in. A green, which today we think means go, actually in 1899 meant approach with caution. In practical terms, a green flag at Chertsey would mean that the train could enter with caution and continue through on its journey to Rakaia. Rakaia, though, was a different kettle of fish because the working notice required the picnic trains to cross with that down train to Ashburton. So a green displayed at Rakaia would mean enter with caution and stop because they would not be able to continue past Rakaia without the permission of Mr May. If we go back to that Saturday night in 1899, events didn't unfold as they were scheduled. That wasn't unusual on the shoestring railway. Trains then, as they do now, run late for a multitude of reasons. On that particular Saturday, the main reason was the weather, which was an appalling southwest gale. So, the trains converge on Rakaia. The first one actually arrives two minutes early, which is a commendable feat of railroading. It whistled for a signal, and a green was displayed, so it came on in and parked on the mainline platform. Five minutes passed, and there was no sign of the down train to Ashburton. So that window, that scheduled window when the three trains would converge on Rakaia had started to close. Events or John May's ability to control events was limited. He couldn't make the trains appear. What he could do though and what he did was he sent a reliable man way out down the tracks with a red lantern to signal the second excursion train. And we'll explore why John May would have done that in a subsequent episode, because he's not the only person on this platform that night who understood the risks that were facing the parked train at the mainline platform. At about 7.01 p.m., the second picnic train whistles for a signal. Immediately after that, it whistles for down brakes. Down brakes is an emergency signal that the driver sounds through three short and sharp whistles. It's a signal to the train's guard to screw down the brakes on the guard's van. In those days, in a normal course of operations, trains were expected to come to a stop purely through the brakes on the locomotive. And this had been the case with the first picnic train. Even though it had two locomotives hauling it, it came to a stop safely through the braking efforts of the lead locomotive only. So once down brakes was heard, those on the platform, John May, the guard for the first picnic train, and the drivers up in the cabs way up ahead of their respective locomotives, they all knew that something was up. Efforts were made to get the standing train moving and accounts differ, but it appears that it made some progress down the tracks. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to prevent a collision. And about 7.03 p.m. on the 11th of March, 1899, the second picnic train collided with the rear of the first picnic train. It was a terrible railway accident. In the hours that followed, there were rescue attempts for the injured and medical treatment for them as well. The bodies of the deceased, four people, four passengers, were also removed from the wreckage. In the days that followed, there was a coronial inquest and there were funerals. 
In the months that followed, the driver of the second train faced a manslaughter charge, and so that was heard in the Supreme Court in Christchurch. Following that, there was a Royal Commission. Following that, there were various claims for compensation by those injured in the accident. And then following that, as the years unfolded, there were reforms. And if you look closely, you will see in the distance semaphore signals, which at the time of the accident were only in a handful of stations on this particular section of line. Subsequent to the accident, as is so often the case, they were installed elsewhere and ultimately across all stations where there was a possibility that trains would cross each other. And all the girls and they love her so Always jolly Heart that is true I know She is the sunshine of paradise early Like, subscribe, ring the bell, feel free to comment.